In this video, we're going to be talking about RAII, or Resource Acquisition is Initialization. The concept itself is pretty simple. I think the acronym sometimes confuses people. It doesn't really make sense unless you already understand what RAII is. And once you do understand it, I think you realize that they probably could have chosen a better acronym. But anyways, confusing acronyms aside, what we're going to talk about in this video is first we're going to discuss what the problem RAII solves is. Um, second, we're going to discuss what is RAII, like what's the definition, um, you know, just explain the concept. And then finally, we'll finish with some examples. We'll actually look at some code and see how RAII can be used to solve real world problems. So what's the problem RAII is trying to solve? Why do we need this thing? In order to help us understand, we can look at some examples. This first example, um, let's say I forget that standard vector exists and I want to dynamically initialize an array. Um, this line of code is fine. It works for you know, creating a dynamically sized array. The problem is if array goes out of scope and I forget to delete it, then we get a memory leak. Um, this is not impossible to solve. All you need to do is just explicitly write delete. The kind of annoyance here is that I have to explicitly manage my memory if I want to avoid leaks. Now let's think about locks. So in this example, we have a global mutex, which is used to synchronize this function that's called in multiple threads. Um, perhaps because you know there's some state mutation inside of the function that can't be called at the same time. And so this is also fine as long as you call global mutex.unlock in all the necessary places. If you forget to unlock the mutex, then as soon as one thread calls its function, every other thread that calls it will deadlock because the lock just never gets released. So again, you kind of have to explicitly do this whole locking unlocking dance. Finally, let's look at an example where we create a new thread. So here we have T1, it's a new thread. Inside, we're running some code inside the thread. This is all fine until T1 goes out of scope. If T1 goes out of scope before T1.join is called, then standard terminate will be called and the program will end. So again, we have to do this additional cleanup step where we call T1.join before the resource, the thread, goes out of scope. And if you've been following along, you might have noticed a particular pattern to these problems. So in each of these problems, the, the first thing we do is we acquire some resource. So in the first example, we acquire memory on the heap. In the second example, we acquire a lock. And in the third example, we acquire a thread. And in isolation, nothing is wrong with these acquisitions. But when the resources go out of scope, then problems can arise. So we get memory leaks and deadlocks and terminations. These problems aren't impossible to solve. In each case, all we need to do is write the corresponding cleanup stanza. So for the first problem, we need to write delete. In the second problem, we need to write unlock. And in the third problem, we need to write, uh, we need to write join. But it's hard to always remember to do this. And even when we do remember, it doesn't always produce safe code. So it's this kind of code that RAII is focused on. It, RAII is meant to make this code safer um, and easier to write. So now that we have some idea for the problems RAII is trying to solve, let's talk about what RAII actually is. Simply put, RAII is when you acquire resources in a constructor and release them in the corresponding destructor. And to clarify, we're talking about RAII in the context of C++ here, but these concepts should generalize to other languages. And so a simple RAII class could look like this, where the constructor acquires some resource, some, uh, some pointer to some memory, and then in the destructor, we release the resource by deallocating the memory. After seeing that definition, you might be wondering, what is a resource? And that's a good question. We can think about it in two different terms. The first is what properties does a resource have? And the second is what are some examples of resources? 
So two pretty key properties are a resource is something that must be acquired before use, and a resource is something that's typically in limited supply. And these properties become clear once we look at our list of examples, which isn't comprehensive, but which includes heat memory, files, sockets, and mutexes. And so for example, take heat memory, it must be acquired before use by calling a function like malloc or calloc. And it's also in limited supply. You can run out of heat memory. And similarly, for files, you must open a file. And then there are not a, um, an infinite amount of files that you can have in a computer. You can run out of files. So one way to think about resources is as an exchange. For example, a program must ask the operating system for heat memory before using it. And if we think about it this way, then a few of those properties from before become a little clearer. So the program here must acquire the memory from the operating system before using it because the operating system is the one managing the memory. Also, the memory is in limited supply. The operating system only has so much memory. And then lastly, although we didn't mention this before, if the program kind of reaches out to the operating system to initially acquire this memory, it makes sense that the program also will have to eventually give this memory back to the operating system. So there's an exchange of resources going on here. The main consequence of doing this RAII thing of acquiring resources in constructors and releasing them in destructors is that we don't have to worry about resource lifetime anymore. For example, instead of always having to write delete pointer whenever we're done with some piece of memory, we can put that code into some object's destructor and the memory will be freed whenever the object gets destroyed. So the paradigm shifts from worrying about resource lifetime to thinking about object lifetime, which is typically an easier problem. And some other consequences or kind of rules of thumb that RAI entails is that we should no longer need to write new or free or delete. And we should also no longer need to explicitly lock or unlock mutexes. And there are a few other things that we could list out here. Of course, there are exceptions. But for example, with the new and free and delete things, instead of manually allocating and deallocating memory, you should use an RAII object which manages the memory for you, i.e. you should couple memory allocation and deallocation to object lifetime. This rule of thumb is typically pretty easy to follow since the standard library provides classes like std vector and std unique pointer, but if for some reason those classes don't fit your case, then you can always roll your own RAI object, in which case the calls to new and delete might be present in the class implementation, but not in user code. And just in general, you should avoid writing cleanup stanzas and move such code into the destructor of an RAI object. And again, there will be exceptions to these rules, but they're good to keep in mind, and they're one of the things that makes C++ code so different from C code. Before we gave some examples of resources, so heap memory and files and locks, now here are some examples of RAII classes in C++, specifically classes from the standard library. So these are all classes that acquire some resource in their constructor and release that resource in their destructor. So for example, the first four are acquiring memory and releasing it, and then the last one is acquiring a lock and releasing it. So these are good to use instead of, for example, manually allocating and deallocating memory, or instead of, for example, manually locking and unlocking a mutex. And so if we really wanna just sum everything up in one picture, I think this is it. Uh, we have our object lifecycle, and what we do is in the constructor, we acquire resources, and in this case, we're acquiring some memory. And in the destructor, we release those resources. And it's really that simple. We're going to end the video by looking at some code and see how RAII can help us out solving some of those problems we saw earlier. For this first example, we have some bad code where, similarly to before, we have a global mutex. We have a function called lock mutex bad which takes in a boolean, and at the very beginning, it locks the global mutex. Then, if the boolean is true, all we do is throw an exception.
and at the end we unlock the global mutex. So this is pretty contrived, but you could imagine this little code here as being, you know, some function, some external function from a library you're using, or just some code of your own that you're using, but you forgot throws and you, you didn't catch it. It's pretty easy to have code that throws in the middle of your function. This could also maybe be an early return um, instead of throwing. And so what happens, we're not going to write any threaded code. All we need to do to kind of emulate that is just run lock mutex bad, passing in true, so this will throw. And then we're gonna run lock mutex bad, passing in false, this will not throw. And then we can see what happens. So this kind of emulates one thread calling it and then another thread calling it. And so if we compile our code and then run it, we can see what happens is that, let's try to split this. So what happens first is that we lock the mutex in the first call, then we throw the exception, the exception gets caught here, and then we call this function again, and then we deadlock right here because we never actually unlock the global mutex. For our second example, we're going to look at some good code. Here we have a function called lock mutex good. It's pretty similar. Um, it takes in a Boolean that determines whether or not the function should throw. But instead of using our global mutex and explicitly locking and unlocking it, we use this thing called standard scoped lock, which is, if you're familiar with it, the same as lock guard, except it can take in, or uh, it can lock multiple mutexes at the same time. And so what this does is calling the constructor here, it will lock this mutex. And when this object goes out of scope, the mutex will be unlocked. So this is an example of RAII in the constructor we acquire some resource, we acquire the lock by locking it, and in the destructor, we release the resource, we unlock it. And we can run this example the same way as before. Um, we call lock mutex good by passing in true, uh, it should throw, and then we call it again, passing in false. And so if we run that code, and by the way, I will include this code in the description of the video so you can try it yourself we can see that what happens here is we don't deadlock. So the first call says locking mutex with scope locked. Uh, we throw the exception, catch it. But now on this second call here, we lock the mutex with the scope lock. Mutex is locked and then we simply return. So we are able to acquire the lock. This line is key. We're able to acquire the lock because when it went out of scope in this first call, the scope lock goes out of scope after the exception is thrown. Um, so once the function is called again, the lock can be reacquired. For our last example, we're going to be taking a look at a custom RAII class that I wrote. It's called custom scoped lock and it's pretty much equivalent to STD scoped lock, or it's a little simpler, but the idea is the same. So STD scoped lock is an RAII class that the standard library provides, and so we're gonna roll our own. So custom scoped lock, its constructor takes in one argument, a STD mutex. What it does is it initializes this private member variable with that mutex, and then it locks it. That's it. In the destructor of custom scope lock, all we do is unlock that mutex. So this is a pretty simple example of RAII. In the constructor of our class, we acquire some resource. We acquire this lock by locking it. And in the destructor, we release some resource. We release this lock by unlocking it. And now we can scroll down and see how this works. So we have basically the same example as before, but now using our custom scope block. We have this function where we pass in a Boolean. Uh, 
at the top, we lock global mutex by um, passing it into the constructor of custom scope lock. <clears throat> Excuse me. And if should throw is true, then we throw an exception. And we have basically the same code to run this function. And so what happens when we run this is, let me scroll up a little bit here. We can see in the logs that the first thing that gets called is custom scope lock locking mutex. And so that gets called in this constructor. And then we have locked a mutex. After that, the exception is thrown. So that happens right here. And then right after the exception is thrown, we can see that custom scope lock has unlocked the mutex. So this is the important part. After this exception is thrown, this guy goes out of scope. If we were not using RAAI, then we would now, you know, this guy would just be locked and any future call to the function would deadlock. Since we are using RAAI, when lock goes out of scope, this destructor is called and we unlock the mutex. Uh, and so again, when the function is called for the second time, uh, this call right here, then it's pretty simple. We say that the custom scope lock is trying to lock the mutex. He succeeds in locking it. And then once it goes out of scope again, this time it just goes out of scope at the end of the function, it unlocks the mutex. If you want to see some more examples, then I'm going to publish a post on this topic as well. So I'll link it in the description, but I go over the mutex example. I also go over um, a few other miscellaneous examples, and I have a lot of the same content that I talked about here, but it's written up in case you'd rather consume it in that form. And so yeah, I'll just link that in the description below. And thanks for watching.